Hello, Oscillator Sync here, and welcome back to the final video in the series where we are taking a deep dive look into the sequencer on the Korg Oddwave. So over the previous videos, we have taken a look at the pitch and the shape and the sequencer lanes, and we've seen how we can use them to create complex, interesting, evolving patterns by way of making use of probability and the different lengths of each of those different lanes. But there's been one thing that's been consistent throughout all of that, and that is that the length of a step has always been the same. It's always been that sort of 16th feel there. So in this video, we're going to take a look at the final lane, which is the timing lane. And this is a very interesting addition to the sequencer because it allows us to modulate within the sequencer how long each step takes. So let's take a look at that. So let's come into the timing lane here. So um, if you've watched the other videos in this series, this will mostly be pretty familiar to you. There's a couple of new things in there, obviously, that are unique to the timing lane. Uh, but we have our loop points to start and end our loop uh, of where our timing sequence is running within the sequence. Uh, as we have seen previously, these start and end points are modulatable. So that's something to bear in mind that we can create more complex patterns by modulating the loop start and end points. We have uh, the mode which allows us to um, change the direction uh, of the, um, the sequence for the timing lane, including random, which is pretty interesting. One thing to note on the timing lane that I've noticed is that if we set it to go in reverse, there appears to be a bug where it always goes forwards the first time if you watch the lights here and then it starts going backwards. I think that's just straight up a bug. Um, that being said, there's not a whole lot of benefit to being able to go backwards in the timing lane, usually, I don't think. Um, so it doesn't bother me too much, but it's worth um, bearing in mind. Our repeats here um, has a slightly different um, uh, meaning to the repeats on all of the other uh, lanes. So if I come into the pitch lane and I turn my repeats down to off, what we get is this. So we go through the sequence and then we get to the end and we stay at the end. Now, because the timing lane is actually controlling the steps of the sequence and whether or not they are advancing functionally, if we turn the repeats to off on this, what we get instead is a situation where the sequencer stops. So that's a slightly different thing going on here. So what we can do in the timing lane is set uh, essentially um, a way of creating a single um, a single hit sequence that happens for each key press and then doesn't repeat. Uh, so for example, if we set this like pretty fast, we can use it to get these sorts of 8-bit arpeggios. Um, so that's actually a really useful thing in the timing lane. It is a way of us controlling the overall progression of the sequence. And if we want it to be a one-shot, this is how we can do it. Or a two shot or, or whatever it needs to be. Uh, for now, I'm just going to set that uh, to infinite, however. We also have note advance here, which works the same as it does on the other sequences. It just means that for each time we press a note, we're going to start at a different step, which of course only really makes any sense if we have something going on inside uh, the sequence, uh, but that's there as it is on the other um, uh, sequence lanes as well. So the timing lane can operate in two different ways or two different domains, if you like. Um, the first, as I have it set here, is that it's set to work with the uh, tempo of the synth, essentially the MIDI clock that's coming in or the internal clock that's running. Uh, and if we're set um, like this, um, what we have on our speed control here is the ability to um, change the multiplier for the clock. So that's uh, the normal clock. We can go to, for example, twice as fast or half as fast and some other fractional ones in here as well. Let's get that triplet feel. Um, of course, if you uh, remember, the sequencer is a unique thing for each layer, so we can use this across multiple layers to get at different kind of timing feels. So for example, I've just got on layer B just a hi-hat that's going. 
And if I change the speed of the timing line here, we can get that kind of triplet feel over the 4-4 uh, four four that's happening on the other layer. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty uh, neat. So I'll just turn that off just for the moment. When we're in this tempo mode, um, the other thing that we have ability to do in the timing lane is just the swing of the overall sequencer. Uh, so if we want to add swing into our pattern, and we can also change uh, the note value that the swing is working on, and this can lead to some really complex um, swing patterns, especially when we bring in the other. Get that sort of drunk triplet swung thing. Which is really cool. Not sort of swing uh, options that you have on a lot of synths actually. So it's. So it's nice to have it there um, as an option. For now, I'm just going to turn swing back off. So that's the timing lane working with the uh, tempo of the synth. Uh, but we can also turn off the tempo mode, which we can do by holding shift and tapping that button there. And now we have a situation where uh, we are just working with time. And uh, just as a spoiler alert, if we come into each of the steps now, we are literally take, setting the uh, number of seconds or fractions of seconds that each of these steps is going to take. So this takes us out of the domain of something that's tempo synced and into the world of having something which is um, just taking up a particular length of time. So we can do very, very fast things here. For example, we want to do uh, those sorts of arpeggios that aren't related to the tempo. Uh, we can also use this to do very, very slow things of course, um, I don't know what the maximum length for a step is. We'll find out in a second, perhaps. Um, so uh, if we're in this mode, um, instead of, of having a tempo um, a time division multiplier, we've just got a scalar for the speed, which just works linearly. Uh, and we should not overlook that like most things on the mod wave this parameter is modulatable so if we wanted to we could um, modulate the speed with uh, oh let's just use the mod wheel and turn that up nice and high and now we have on the mod wheel a way to modulate the time uh, there now that also works for the um for the tempo divisions as well so if i just uh delete that one there and i come back to my tempo so my timing here and i turn the tempo back on i can also modulate the speed here but that's a different parameter as far as it's concerned at the back end so we have to do it separately so we can add that enter that speed tempo use the mod wheel again enter to continue and this is going to be um, working with the uh, the division instead so it's going to stay in time if you like um, with say with uh, another thing that's going uh, on the clock. Uh, so let's just remove that for now as well so I don't accidentally knock the mod wheel and wonder what the hell is going on during the rest of the video. Cool. So that's the, um, the sort of main page, the master page for the timing lane. Uh, let's actually go in to the individual steps and see what we can do there. So let's just start with the uh, tempo turned off so we can see how drunk we can make things uh, by just changing the um, the time of each step in seconds. So uh, we can come into each of these different steps and we can change the duration of one of those steps. So let's make that one a bit longer, make this one a bit shorter, make this one very short, make this one a bit longer and so on. And we should be able to create a really, really drunk sequence if that's the kind of thing that we are after. So 
so you can create these really sort of complex uh, grooves but of course um, this isn't tempo synced to anything so if we put the hi-hat in you can see that it's just meandering all over that particular uh, pulse there uh, there is a way that we can constrain this a little bit, which is by making use of the master page. So we can come into the master page here. And so the, the master lane, I think this is the first time I've actually mentioned it. So this is the master lane. The master lane allows us to constrain how the whole sequence is repeating. So it gives us a overall length of the sequence, at which point it will restart. So um, if we turn that on, um, here we've got the loop dura duration set to three seconds. So every three seconds, this is now going to restart no matter where it is. So you can kind of hear that falling back into it there. Now, unfortunately with the master lane, um, if the timing lane is set, to not have a tempo there's no way for us to turn the master lane to have a tempo and have this sort of drunken falling over itself thing repeat across a number of bars so if i turn the tempo on in the master lane it, it turns it on everywhere uh, which is a real shame because it would be really really good to be able to have this sort of drunken uh lolloping kind of sequence that then still uh, always restarts on on like the fourth bar or the or one bar or whatever it happens to be so you can still have that really really drunk feel um but um but have it synchronized with the tempo somehow um you can still kind of get that drunken feel by making use of some of those triplet swings and stuff so yeah we can still create that sort of that that, that sort of lo-fi drunken feel for the sequence but it's a shame we can't lock it on uh, the master lane. But um, if you do work out your BPM, you can work out how long a number of bars lasts in seconds, and then you can kind of uh, create the loop duration based on that. But yeah, it's a shame that we can't still lock it to tempo. But I digress. Um, one thing that is um, interesting and useful to note on the timing lane is that if you switch between tempo and uh free timing uh you still get um it still saves what was previously on the steps in those two different modes they're kind of stored as two different values so we've got our drunk sequence here if i go and turn tempo back on it's back to being tempo sync but if i turn tempo off we've got our drunk sequence again so that's nice if you're experimenting with different feels I think the reality is, though, that most people want to use this with the uh, tempo sync thing for more traditional sequencing anyway. Um, so let's turn that on. And now if we come into our individual steps in our duration, rather than having uh, seconds, we have a note value and then also a multiple of those notes. So uh, the simplest thing to hear here maybe would be to make this uh, first step uh, take twice as long as everything else. Oh, I've got the master turned on still there. You can hear it repeating. Uh, there we go. Uh, so let's turn that master back off uh, so we can hear it just going freely. So that first note is always going to be the, uh, the same note because our timing lane and our pitch lane are the same length. If we were to change the length of one of them, like uh, let's change the length of timing lane here and uh, what we'll have now is that that uh, longer note is going to happen every uh, seven steps which is going to offset where it sits within our pitch so we've got that kind of evolving falling over itself sequence but it's not the pitch that is changing it's how long the seventh step or, or the first step of seven is each time so we get this really cool evolution of our sequence and it's a really classic sort of techno trick really um, but we can do other things as well so let's go back to eight steps here so um, we could for example on these last three uh, set these to be triplets like that 
which is really, really cool, right? Now, this is working for us because of the length of our... Um, uh, length of our sequence but if we wanted to make things um evolve but still sound right so for example if i come back to the timing here and i try and add just a step at the end this is going to sound kind of but you're here it doesn't sound great you kind of lose sort of where everything sits so if you're making use of some of the more complex timing options inside the timing lane and you still want things to sound cohesive and uh, sort of musically easy to understand, you do need to do a little bit of maths and work out how many um, steps you're going to want in your timing lane as opposed to your other lanes. So that kind of sounds a bit more sort of easy to understand now that I've got 12 steps in the timing lane. Now we could go with something that's a little harder to parse. And because we don't have that repetition, it's kind of hard to hear where... Um, where things lie but if we come into the master here and make use of that maybe two bars is even too much there see there now everything is repeating once per bar so we've got that more complex part going on there but because we've now got a repetition that we can easily hold on to, things are a little bit easier to understand. So um, the thing to bear in mind with making use of the master lane is, is, is it's going to reset everything, including all of your other sequences um, here. So it does mean that it constrains you a little bit in terms of how you can uh, create evolving patterns because they're going to naturally not evolve as much because they're re they're repeating um, but we can go for longer repetitions and still hopefully hear what's going on see just having to repeat every four bars just grounds the sequence So if you are you're making use of the timing lane to do these kind of complex um, patterns uh, of timing, you do need to maybe consider how you're going to ground that to make it sound uh, musical. So I'll just set these back to uh, their default. One other thing that you can for sure do with the um, timing lane is make use of it to do uh, ratchets by going with much lower note values here so I'm going to do four of those but it's not going to repeat what's in the um, in the pitch lane in this case it's it's just going to ratchet through them in sequence so it's not a true ratchet on each of those steps uh, to do that you'll have to modify what you're doing in the pitch lanes perhaps um, but uh, certainly of all of the things that I've used that for, um, that's one of the ones I keep coming back to. Now, um, if we want to create um, stuff that, uh, again, is sort of musically um, meaningful, but evolves a little bit, we could also make use of the random order, of course. So perhaps if I set this one to be three uh, notes long and then we trim off uh, two notes there, no, three notes there. So we've got a nice sort of lolloping feel there, but if we go into the random order here, we can maybe get something which is evolving in more interesting ways.
which somehow works better than just having something sat at the start each time for me. I don't know what it is about it. Um, but of course, because um, this is going to be happening per note, if we play two notes at the same time, we get interesting interactions between them as the different notes start to go over each other in different ways. Right, let's uh, turn the random off and get this back to just a one note thing and go back to eight notes here because we should probably, probably, <laughs> a pun intended, talk about probability. So probability on the timing lane works differently to probability on all of the other lanes. So if we come into the pitch lane, just to remind ourselves, and if I set the probability of this first note, well, let's set it to zero, what's going to happen is that this step is going to be skipped over every single time. So we're going to have essentially a seven step sequence. And if we set this somewhere in the middle, then sometimes it'll get skipped and sometimes it won't, which will give us that kind of phasing thing happening. If we turn on the hi-hat. We can hear that our sequence has been pushed and pulled uh, into different places as we go through. So probability normally on the other lanes just skips over that step. On the tempo, sorry, on the timing lane, I should say, it works a little bit uh, differently. So um, if I set, um, let's just set the probability of this, uh, let's go to the fifth step and set it to zero, so it will never actually fire. Now, if the timing lane works the same as everything else, having a step in the timing lane set to zero probability, but all of the other steps being identical, it should just roll through, right? Um, but what we get instead is this. So, what's happening here? Well, we can kind of see it if we look in the sequence view here. Um, if you watch the timing, which is the top one, as opposed to the pitch one, You'll see that it is skipping that step, but the length of that step is still being taken into consideration. So what we're talking about with probability on the timing lane is not the probability that the step will fire, it's the probability that that step will make the rest of the sequence advance. So you can see that the rest of the sequence is pausing each time we get there. So if we set this uh, step to be um, a probability that's somewhere in between, uh, we'll get the same thing where things are being thrown out of sync, but it's happening in a different way. What's happening is that at some point, the sequencer pauses, essentially. So this is a really interesting way for us to get complexity into a sequence that's otherwise pretty straightforward. Um, and probably the most effective way to do it compared to like the, um, uh, the change in the length of things, in my opinion, I think this is a, a more uh, instant way to get stuff that sounds right most of the time. if we layer up another note as well. And as long as your notes are chosen carefully so that they don't clash too badly, you can use this to create evolving patterns, evolving 
rhythmic ideas, which are different to having the probability set in our other steps. The one thing we haven't discussed on a per step basis is this type parameter here. Now it's been set to note for all of the stuff that we've been doing so far. And what that means is that uh, any step that has uh, a note type on it, it's going to progress the sequencer as normal. And it's also going to fire out a step to any um, thing that's listening for a step. So for example, in this patch, I've got it so that a step in the sequencer is going to fire off my amp and filter envelope, which is why we're getting the sound that we're getting there. You don't have to set it up that way, but that's how I got it set up at the moment. Uh, but of course we can change it. That's why it's a parameter here. Um, so the first thing we can change it to is a rest. Uh, and what a rest will do is it will still progress the sequencer, but it won't fire out a step. So anything that's listening for a step is not going to hear it. It's also not going to um, do whatever is sat inside each of the other sequences. So it will go back to a default value for each of those. So you can hear that on step five. Now we're not getting a, uh, a note being fired off. And if we rest on this one as well, you can hear that you've got that um, gap happening there. Our filters are being opened up, etc. The other thing that's happening there, which is subtle when I play this note, <laughs> is that um, on those uh, steps in the pitch sequencer, it's going back to whatever note I'm holding down. Now, that could be a problem uh, because in my pitch uh, lane here i've got fit to scale turned on so it's always playing in c minor so um when i am playing a note which still kind of works within that scale and it drops to that sort of unset um note that's fine but if i play like an e natural um when it gets to that rest it's going to sound pretty gross Playing that E natural against it. Whereas when I had um, notes uh, going on in those steps, so that one and that one, even when I'm playing in uh, an E natural because of the way the pitch uh, lane is set up, I still get something that's in C minor, it's fitting it to, to the scale. Is that something to watch out for there. Now, of course, uh, with the rests, they uh, work the same as everything else in terms of the length. So we can use that rest to lay things out differently. And the same with the probability as well. Um, so you, you can combine the fact that things aren't getting fired, things aren't progressing. To get again pretty complex sounds and we can make use of the master if we wanted to to resynchronize that every couple of bars again to get sort of evolving but meaningful uh, sequences going on there the last uh, type that we have here, uh, let's put the probability back up to full, is uh, called gate. And what gate does, um, what gate does, <laughs> I'll qualify that in just a second, is that when it gets to the gate on the, uh, the timing lane, is it stops the sequence. Just make sure we can see what's going on here. If we uh, come back here. So when we get to six, it just stops. So the manual <laughs> says that it should stop when it gets there and the sequence should restart when it sees a note off, but it doesn't. The manual is wrong or there's a bug. I don't know which one it is. Um, I don't know which one of those things would be more useful, but there we go. That That is the situation is that... Um, it just stops when it gets there. 
Uh, so what's this for? So there are a couple of different things we can do with, with the gates uh, that are actually quite uh, useful. Again, this is going to lead to a situation where there is a finite sequence no matter what we do here. But for example, if we set our mode to random, what we have essentially is a little phrase generator which is actually pretty cool and uh, uh, has definitely some really interesting um, uh, practical applications. You could have um, m random stuff going on in the pitch. We could also have pitch set up to, to note advance so that it sort of naturally moves through a particular sequence. So there are definite things that the gate can be used for, but it, you have to think about its application musically in terms of what you're trying to uh, create. It's certainly not going to be a patch where you're just holding down a key and something continues to happen the whole time. Um, but um, yeah, having the gate in there is a really interesting way to um, create different lengths. We could also, for example, modulate the start length, uh, sorry, the start position in our pattern based upon uh, velocity. And you could um, set up a timing pattern where you have multiple gates going on there and then you could be modulating the start position based on, say, the mod wheel and that allows you to move through different musical phrases or th with a velocity or something like that. So there's definitely some applications there, but it's not necessarily as obvious um, as uh, an application as, as most of the other um, uh, modes for the steps in the timing lane, I don't think. So I think um, that probably concludes our little uh, excursion through the I think wonderfully creative sequencer on the mod wave as, this is, as I said many times I'm sure I think the sequencer is probably my favorite aspect of the mod wave and I'd love to see some of these ideas turn up in future sense I mean god knows I'd love to have this sequencer on the op 6 for example uh, but it it is what it is um if you enjoyed this video and if you enjoyed the series I hope it was helpful um as always um leaving a like on the video really helps out the channel and make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on any upcoming synth fun that we have planned on the channel but otherwise until next time take care bye bye